Hi, I'm Todd Gitlin, and I work with Writers for Democratic Action. It's an honor to speak with you. A few words first. Nothing comes out of the blue, least of all cruelty, even on a Sunday, sunny September morning. But I'd like to back up for a moment before September 11, 2001, since actually America's 21st century began when the Republican majority in the Supreme Court in Bush v. Gore ordered a halt to the Florida recount on dubious grounds and ushered in two decades of lies, misinformation, stupidity, mayhem, and sheer rage. Bush's response to the massacres was spas spasmodic. He doubled down on national insecurity. Having defaulted on his duty to keep the country safe, his administration latched onto a convenient delusion that Iraq Saddam Hussein was the actual culprit. Delusions compounded, we might say virally. The upshot was a cascade of diversion and mayhem, culminating in multi-trillion dollar wars and a nativist hysteria leading straight to Donald Trump's unhinged, racist, xenophobic, and otherwise sinister crusades fueled by enablers in full cry who insisted that of course the black president had been born in Kenya, but her emails and Benghazi. We were engulfed in paranoia designed to preserve the myth that exceptional America was under siege by dark-skinned and educated people. And the so-called war on terror morphed into a fuller terror, including the one unleashed by a pandemic 40 million Americans infected and counting, that the ignoramus Donald Trump was as equipped to fight as the devastating wars unleashed by George W. Bush. National insecurity was the demagogue's road to power because he and his adoring throngs and sycophants, fueled by a charged up propaganda machine, had kicked loose of logic and evidence. Jettison your old fashioned reason, they cried. That's elite stuff, too heavy a burden to bear. So unhinged America, a bit less than half the country, doubled down on the barbarism barely held in check before them. And an army of raging racist resentment and contempt for women set forth to salute their commander in chief as he glided down the escalator in Trump Tower to prove that when all was said and done, America amounted to nothing but a morass of vicious resentment in the service of a white oligarchy of untold corruption. And so we were on the glide path to the not so laughable push of January 6th. The past is unchangeable. A blurred future is careening toward us, but it can be more decent and habitable, more just and less cruel. This is on us now. All minds at work, all hands on deck. Perseverance is all. And now I'd like to turn over the proceedings and the moderating to Jackie Lydon, journalist, author of the memoir, Daughter of the Queen of Sheba, and familiar to many of us as an NPR voice reliably. Jackie? Todd, thank you so much. I just want to tell everyone what a great privilege it is to be here with Writers for Democratic Action, such a distinguished group of thinkers on this tragic day that took the lives of nearly 3,000 people in three states uh, 20 years ago and, of course, left thousands more hurt. 20 years ago today, I stood right here in this room, the window behind me, looking out, listening to the sirens here in Brooklyn, and I instantly became NPR's first reporter on the air that morning, riding my bike later to Ground Zero, and spending the next two weeks reporting from there. The truth though, live on the radio that morning, I knew virtually nothing. Later I was in Afghanistan and then Iraq. What we've learned since and what we're going to be discussing in the panels this afternoon, what we can discern from our reaction about the global war on terror as it's been called and the wars entwined with it, Iraq and Afghanistan, we can root in history, talk about the chapters still to be opened and those we really can't close. These are the questions that we'll be putting to the panel and we'll invite all of you to join in. 
for writers for democratic action. And I'll begin with Paul Auster. Paul Auster is an American journalist, American writer and filmmaker, a novelist based in Brooklyn, ever identified with the city with books like New York Trilogy, Brooklyn Folly, Sunset Park. He's also a cultural ambassador who's reached audiences in over 40 languages and spoken frequently to so many members of the foreign press, which I think is really important. His most recent novel, 4321, was shortlisted for the Booker Prize, and he'll be publishing Burning Boy, The Life and Work of Stephen Crane, a biography, next month. Paul and I also collaborated on a series of stories from real people just before 9-11, 2001, called I Thought My Father Was God and Other True Tales from NPR's National Story Project. Paul, my friend, I'm really glad to be with you today. Thank you, Jackie. I'm so happy you're the one who's moderating this. For all, it's, There are 27 right reasons why you should be the one. All right, this is what I've written for today to start things off. <clears throat> we all know the consequences now. A so-called war on terror that has gone on for two decades and has led to such atrocities as the bombing deaths of thousands of civilians state-sanctioned torture, extraordinary rendition, Guantanamo, black sites, Abu Ghraib, the invasion and occupation of two countries that led to two protracted and failed wars, bombings and interventions in six other countries, the deaths of no fewer than 900,000 people, and no doubt many more than that, the destabilization of societies that created 40 million refugees, and a migrant crisis that weakened Western European democracies and contributed to the Brexit vote that severed the UK from the European Union. On the home front, war hysteria, hysteria and the demonization of our Muslim population has undermined the rule of law through unconstitutional devices such as the Patriot Act, which has turned America into a surveillance state and led to a dramatic increase in hate crimes. As the country that spends more on defense than any other country in the world, we've also seen fit to spend billions more on outsourcing many of our war operations to private contractors and have militarized police departments across the country by giving them vast amounts of war equipment from the Pentagon's ever-growing surplus of tanks, body armor, and high-tech instruments, state-of-the-art tools designed for 21st century armed combat. Eight trillion dollars down the drain. Untold numbers of mentally shattered war veterans who have resorted to suicide through lack of medical care. And a gradual breakdown of American society that has led to the current impasse of a country that is increasingly at war with itself. None of this was inevitable. And as I think back to that Tuesday morning 20 years ago, what comes to me first is walking my 14-year-old daughter Sophie to the subway station at Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn and kissing her goodbye as she set off on her first solo trip to Manhattan to begin her first day of high school. As it turned out, her train passed under the World Trade Center just half an hour before the first building was attacked. Needless to say, she did not return to Brooklyn when school was let out that afternoon, but spent the night with friends on the Upper West Side. When I returned home, I called Jackie Lydon, the moderator of our panel today, the same Jackie for a, who for a full year had been my interlocutor on NPR for my monthly show, The National Story Project. There was a question I needed to ask her, and I caught her just as she was running out of her apartment. A plane crashed into one of the towers at the World Trade Center, she said, I'm on way, I'm, I'm, and I'm on my way over there to report on it. My wife, Siri Hisved, and I went into our daughter's bedroom on the top floor of our house and looked out through the window at the smoking tower across the river in lower Manhattan. Still not certain whether we were looking at an accident or a planned attack by a suicide bomber. We went downstairs and turned on the television. And five or 10 minutes later, when we saw the second plane crash into the second building, we knew. It was a beautiful September morning and all the windows in the house were open. 
And because the wind was blowing from Manhattan to Brooklyn that day, it would go on blowing in our direction for the rest of the week. It wasn't long before the smells of the destroyed and smoking towers were inside the house. A terrible stinging odor produced by a combination of flaming plastic, melted electrical wires, pulverized building materials, and the, and the incinerated bodies of close to 3,000 people. We shut the windows and kept them shut for days afterward. Not long after the second tower collapsed, I received a telephone call from my friend Michael Naumann, my former German publisher and now the editor of the weekly newspaper Die Zeit. They were going to press early the next morning, he said, and he wanted me to write a short piece about what was going on in New York. Would I do it? I don't know, I said. I'm pretty shaken, but I'll try to take a crack at it in the afternoon. An hour or two later, Siri and I went out for a walk through the neighborhood. Many people were wearing handkerchiefs over their faces and others had put on painter's masks. That was when we learned that 12 of the 30 firefighters from our local station had been killed in the towers. The man who used to cut my hair back then stood in front of his empty barber shop and told me that the woman who owned the antique shop next door had been on the phone with her son-in-law who was trapped in his office on the 107th floor of one of the towers less than an hour before the building crumbled to the ground. <clears throat> when we stopped in at our local liquor store to buy a couple of bottles of wine, our friend Charlie, who had managed the store for years, looked up from behind the counter with a grim, hollowed out expression in his eyes and told us that his brother's wife, who worked as a flight attendant for United Airlines, had been killed in the crash of Flight 93 in Pennsylvania. Shaken, yes, but by four o'clock, I was thinking clearly enough to sit down and write a couple of pages for Michael. The piece ended with these remarks. We all knew this could happen. We have been talking about the possibility for years. And now that the tragedy has struck, the consequences of this assault will no doubt be terrible. More violence, more deaths, more pain for everyone. And so the 21st century finally begins. How and why did I know this? And if I did know this, how can I contend that what happened after that day was not inevitable? Because George W. Bush was president, a man who had lost the popular vote to Al Gore and had been put in office by means of a legal coup orchestrated by the Republican controlled Supreme Court. And this man of limited intelligence, who knew, who knew little or nothing about American history or foreign affairs, who had never had the curiosity to travel abroad or even to go on a vacation to a single European country, who had surrounded himself with vicious Cold War hawks such as Cheney and Rumsfeld, was bound to make the worst decisions possible, which was precisely what he did. On Friday the 14th, the third day after the attacks, a large crowd of between five and 10,000 people gathered that evening in our Brooklyn neighborhood to march down 7th Avenue to the local fire station as a show of thanks to the men who had lost their lives on the 11th. Everyone in the crowd was holding candles. And at one point, we all began to, we all began to sing, we shall overcome, not as a call to violent revenge, but as a lament for the ones who had died. The surviving firefighters sat atop their trucks and wept, and one by one, hundreds of weeping marchers embraced them. Not once did anyone in the crowd utter the word war. Earlier that same day, September 14th, Congress voted to approve a measure that empowered the president to, quote, use necessary and appropriate force in Afghanistan and any other country involved in the 9-11 attacks. The only dissenting vote came from Barbara Lee, a black congresswoman from California who was excoriated in the press for her lack of patriotism. What she said before the House that day was simply this, our country is in a state of mourning. Some of us must say, let's step back for a moment. Let's just pause just for a minute and think through our actions today so that this does not spin out of control. 
she was right and everyone else was wrong. Thank you, Paul. It's difficult to listen to some of that and think back. It's difficult to read it too. Our next guest is going to be Elias Khoury, who's joining us from Beirut. Anyone with any knowledge of the cultural life of the Middle East will be familiar with this Lebanese author. He's the author of numerous novels and plays. Elias Khoury was also for many years the cultural editor for the distinguished newspaper Al Nahar, one of the most respected in the Middle East, and he's taught at a host of prestigious American universities and others around the world. Now, we went through a lot to get Elias's comments for you today, and we're unable to have him live, but he's recorded a beautiful essay just a couple of hours ago, just for you. So we're going to play that for you. It's about eight minutes long. You, you won't be able to put questions to him later, but we're so glad we have this slice of him. So the writers for democratic action, I give you Elias Khoury. I have lost it for a second, but I feel like I'm going to get it back. So, okay, stand by. You're hearing our producer, Christina, who's also at the book. Bear with me. We knew we were taking a risk, but we wanted to. Mm -hmm. Give me a sec. Okay. <laughs> I am happy to be with these distinguished writers and with all of you. I said that I'm with you. Hmm. Well, it worked beautifully <laughs> a little earlier. Do you have it to text, Jackie? Perhaps you can read it. I'm wondering if I can play it on my phone. You cannot After hear it? No. no. We can't because hear it. I, I can. During the Nakba of 1948, the idea was that the Palestinians are present because they stayed in Palestine, now named Israel, but they are absent in order that the, that the absentees law will be applied on them, which means the confiscation of their homes and lands, which made them refugees and strangers in their own country. Of course, this concept does not apply on me. But on the other hand, I feel that I am a stranger in Beirut, my own city where I was born and lived all my life. Because the cosmopolitan city that was Beirut, every resident used to feel that he is at home, is no more. Beirut became the city of strangers. I lived and worked in New York for a long time, and I felt that New York is home for me. And I used to feel that there is a special relation between Beirut and New York. Beirut was a pan-Arab city and New York the city of the world. The New Yorkers give their city the name of the Big Apple. And Beirut was called by the great Palestinian poet Mahmoud Darwish, an apple. Once, when I read the poem of Darwish to my two children, who were small kids, my son, with astonished eyes, asked me, an apple? 
then they can eat it. Of course, I laughed and explained <laughs> to him that this is only a metaphor. But unfortunately, the blind history can make the metaphor a reality. And now we are witnessing how the city is sliced and destroyed to the extent that the terrible explosion of August the 4th can be compared to an atomic bomb destroyed half of the city. But this is not what I'm going to speak tonight. When I remember the images of 9-11, I feel a combination of rage and sadness. The savagery of history come with the attack of 9-11 towards us to show us that we are still living in a kind of a forest. I can say that after 20 years, I can't understand the logic of the catastrophe. It seems that we need the eyes of the future in order to understand the present that is intended to become the past. The future, I mean our present now, shows us the, the cynicism of history and that the globalization that led the world not to a struggle between civilizations, but to a struggle between barbarisms. I do not and cannot and must not understand, underestimate the tragedy of New York, which had great impacts on the American lives regarding freedom in all its levels. But I want to invite you to come with me in a trip towards the Islamic world, the Islamic and Arab worlds, from Afghanistan to Iraq, and from Syria and Lebanon to Palestine. All of us know that the beginning was the project of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, which was sponsored by the Americans, the Saudis, and the Pakistanis intelligence. This doesn't mean that there are no interior problems that led the Arab world to its present catastrophes. But till now, nobody can explain why Iraq was invaded by the Bush administration. The impact of this invasion was not only the destruction of Iraq, but it, it opened the doors of hell in our region. Al-Qaeda was reinvented in Iraq to the extent that it gave birth to Daesh, or our ISIS, as you call it, with all its savage action. Is it a hazard that the terrible dictatorship of Saddam Hussein opened the doors for the invasion of Iraq? The combination, this combination, destroyed the region and legitimized the, uh, the, its occupation and permitted Israel to practice apartheid openly with no reaction from the so-called free world. 9-11 was a human tragedy. It paved the way for this world that lost its human values and soul and, ma and made everything, anything possible. The barbarism of dictatorships and occupation and the greed of cap and the madness of power and the greed of capitalism made us all strangers in this world that is no that is no more ours what can words do or say how can literature continue the exploration of of the human soul how can we travel like sindibad in the 1001 nights to see our lives with new eyes. Literature cannot change, cannot change, cannot change. Sorry, literature cannot change things, 
but it can change but it can change our eyes our new journey is towards our eyes where we can reinvent the values of equality and freedom thank you Thank you, everyone. And I apologize that it wasn't absolutely right to time, but we are so fortunate that we got that. And we so much wanted to share Elias's words with you. So thank you for your patience. Our next speaker is going to be Heather Cox Richardson. Now, I never feel that my day is complete unless I've read Heather Cox Richardson's letter from an American. And it's often the very last or the very first thing that I go to. A historian and writer who teaches at Boston College, Heather has limbed the id, the ego, and the superego of American politics with six books covering the Civil War, Reconstruction, and the American West. And if journalism is the rough draft of history, her daily history smooths out some of that coarse roughness. Her writing also happens to be the most successful column on Substack. Welcome, Heather. It's a pleasure to be here even though it's not a good day to be here. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately about the ways in which we are commemorating the 20th anniversary of the attacks of 9-11 and the historical reality of what happened after those attacks, because it's almost as if they're two separate conversations, and yet they are both based in reality. They are both based in fact. So on the one hand, we have things like the speech that George W. Bush, former President George W. Bush, gave today in Pennsylvania to commemorate the people on Flight 93 who brought down the plane in Pennsylvania rather than permitting it to crash into what we think was going to be the capital, um, in which he talked about what it meant to be an American and what it means to be an American. And he said, uh, the, the vision he had of people during his presidency, of people who, as he said, instinctively grabbed for a neighbor's hand and rallied to the cause of one another. That is the America I know. And he went on through a list of reflections on Americans as being um, supportive of each other and part of a community, a, a community that, that worked together to survive the unthinkable. And he went on to say, this is not mere nostalgia. It is the truest version of ourselves. It is what we have been and what we can be again. And then he said something interesting. He said, 20 years ago, terrorists chose a random group of Americans on a routine flight to be collateral damage in a spectacular act of terror. The 33 passengers and seven crew of Flight 93 could have been any group of citizens selected by fate. In a sense, they stood in for us all. The terrorists soon discovered that a random group of Americans is an exceptional group of people. Facing an impossible circumstance, they comforted their loved ones by phone, braced each other for action, and defeated the designs of evil. This is true, this happened. And when we think of 9-11 and we think of today's commemorations, we think of people like Wells Crowther, who was the man in the red bandana who ran into the building to escort people out to safety. Or we think of people like those on Flight 93 who made an un unthinkable decision to bring down their plane to save the American government. Those things are true and they happened. But other things are also true. It is also true that on the morning of 9-11, there was an editorial in the New York Times that announced, and I quote, there is a whiff of panic in the air. This is the morning of 9-11 before the attacks. And what they were talking about was the fact that the George W. Bush administration's policy of tax cuts, if you recall, there was a $1.3 trillion tax cut immediately uh, after he took office, were not popular. And they were, in fact, uh, sinking his presidency. And after 9-11, after the attacks on 9-11, what happened was that that whiff of panic amongst the members of the administration turned into a sense of mission. With the collapse of the USSR in, uh, during George H.W. Bush's term, 
the, um, the country had seemed under George W. Bush to have found, as he said, a mission again. In our grief and anger, we have found our mission and our moment. And as his popularity approached 90% in the wake of the attacks, as Americans did in fact try to come together, did in fact try to support America, he and his administration used that moment to advance a really different version of America than the one that I just described. And that version of America was an America that was driven not by community, not by a bunch of people uh, helping each other and speaking to, together to move the country into safety, but rather a group of a small group of people, uh, generally wealthy white men, uh, running the country in such a way that they controlled it and they made sure that um, that they spoke for everybody by doing things like pushing the idea of gerrymandering and pushing the idea of uh, suppressing the vote. And from that, we got uh, a different kind of economy. So for example, there was supposed to have been a peace dividend after the fall of the USSR, which gave us a lot more money to spend on domestic programs. In fact, the opposite was true after 9-11. Money continued to flow into the military and into the idea first of attacking Afghanistan, where the Taliban had gone ahead and protected Al Qaeda, which had enabled um, Osama bin Laden to, to go ahead and launch the attacks against America. But after the initial attack on Al-Qaeda and the initial quite successful attack, um, rocket attacks against, um, uh, against the Taliban, um, the U.S. war in Afghanistan turned on to, into a war with soldiers on the ground in late uh, 2001. By 2002, the administration had a new doctrine, and that doctrine was the Bush Doctrine, which said that America should preemptively fight against uh, people who could become terrorists. And by 2003, we had entered into a regime change designed war in Iraq. And we had done the same in Afghanistan. And this actually spoke not to what happened after 9-11, but to a much earlier project from 1997 among people like Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney to go ahead and find an American mission in the idea of essentially ruling uh, the rest of the world. And that is a really different vision of what happened in the, the commemorations that we're talking about today with 9-11. So what I've been thinking about trying to do is hold both of those together because they are both real. They both happened, both the attacks on our economy and our, um, uh, our move to becoming an imperial power uh, in the 21st century. And along with that, the attacks on our civil liberties and the fact that our nation embraced torture, which has a long history in America of, uh, of lawmakers rejecting the concept of the very sorts of torture in which we engaged after 9-11. So how do we hold those two things, both of which are true, together? How do those two things both represent America? And I think the more I think about it, that what we, what we like to commemorate when we talk as President, former President Bush did in Pennsylvania today, or as we think about when we think about Mr. Crowther and running back into that building and all the people who helped each other after 9-11 and all the people who volunteered to go protect uh, America by joining the military. What we think about is a democracy that is run by ordinary people, that ordinary people, given the opportunity, do in fact work to create a community that that creates a, a safe, healthy space for all of us. But at the same time in American history, we have always had the other as well. The idea that a few wealthy men are really the ones who know how to run things and they're the ones who should have the money, who should have the power, and who should be able to impose their vision on the rest of us. And when I come out of thinking about this particular moment, not 9-11 itself, I'm not speaking about that, but about the way we think about what it means to be an American in this moment, uh, 20 years later, when we're thinking about what 9-11 meant, are we in fact the vision that uh, the former president gives us today, or are we what his administration gave us uh, 20 years ago? And we clearly, to my mind, have, moved in the direction of the latter rather than honoring the former. And a lot of people nowadays are talking about this is who America was or about getting back or this is who America is or about getting back to that America. And I think that there is hope for that in this moment, 20 years later, when we see what the vision of the Bush administration 
gave us the the longest war in history, the extraordinary numbers of dead, the movement of wealth upward, the lack of power among ordinary Americans. It feels like we are at a moment when, in fact, we might take back not the horrors of 9-11, but the window it gave us on what America could be and perhaps what America should be. And what I always come back to when I think about 9-11 is that of course, we can't know, but we believe that what happened on Flight 93 before the uh, clients on the plane took the plane down in that field was that they took a vote. And if that isn't what America is about, I'm not sure what is. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Heather. That stunning and we will come back to you and unpack that a little bit even further afterwards um and speaking of the coterie of who governs and is governed it might be a good lead-in to speaking to caroline randall wilson caroline is a poet and writer she is joining us from nashville where she's writer in residence at vanderbilt university her essay my body is a confederate monument ran in the New York Times last year, and it's a really powerful testament on the legacy of the treatment of black bodies at the hands of white overlords during slavery and after. She's also the author of the poetry collection, Lucy Negro, Redux, and with her mother, the writer Alice Randall, Soul Food Love, which received the NAACP Image Award. Caroline Randall Wilson, thank you so much for being with us from Nashville today. Thank you so much for having me, Jackie. So many people know that I'm a bit obsessed with genealogy, both family of blood and family of choice. But there's also that tremendously important third voluntary selection, um, geography of choice. And for reasons I've not got time to get into today, the notion of the United States as a geography of choice, of choosing patriotism, of choosing citizenship here as a voluntary act is fraught. My black blood did not get here by choice and it remains nearly unspeakable, the atrocities enacted to make room for the men who may claim this country in the form that it is, such as it is now. But there is nothing complicated for me in this moment or ever about claiming New York City. New York has always been a home of choice for me and a home away from home, and that's been true in my family for generations. My great-grandmother, Alberta, was born the product of plantation rape on the way across Georgia land her father's family owned and her mother's family worked in 1906. She was raised by her black grandmother who'd been born a slave to her father's family. But it was her two grandmothers together, her white and her black grandmother, who sent her to New York. Neither of them could stand to see her share crop that land. And they sent her to the Harlem Academy to get safe and feel freer. When I was born in Nashville, Tennessee, my mother brought me home to that great grandmother's house. I was surrounded by artifacts of Harlem. I existed because New York City had made room for my family. New York is in and of my body and bones. Now, I'm also something obsessed with dates of significance, infamous ones, precious ones, iconic birthday years, anniversaries of seismic events. And now there are not one, but three dates that I'm meditating on today. And I hope you'll bear with me as I weave them together. There's September 11th, of course, but also January 6th and August 24th, a personal date to inform us about the two. We are here today to commemorate an iconic United States tragedy. And that, in my opinion, is good and right for us to do. It is also good and right, in my opinion, for me to start my conversation about collective American tragedy with another American tragedy, the murder of Emmett Till. On August 24th, 1955, 32 years before I was born to the day, Emmett Till walked into Bryant's grocery store and, I had, and had an exchange that would ultimately end his life. 32 years to the day. I still can't get over that somehow. And words I've got to say next, collective memory, epigenetics, inherited trauma, 
the way certain geographies hold hard stories like DNA does? What was the world remembering? What were black mothers remembering? What size was America heaving in memorial and grief on the day that I landed here? How do our bodies, how does this land remember this day, September 11th, from the vantage of 20 years? 20 years from September 11th, 2001, and the unity and solidarity of that day has given way to the grim divides we saw plainly on January 6th of this very year, but we knew because Emmett Till was 14 years old when his death became a stark reminder to the world that the Civil War was not yet won, is not yet won, that this country is still not yet won. We remain in so many ways divided. I'm talking in circles, but hard truths give way to hard truths. Remember how I said I'm something obsessed with dates and anniversaries? Well, since grade school, with a hefty dose of Tennessee Sunday School thrown in for good measure, insisted by my father, I've been obsessed with and fearful of two birthdays. Two years of my life I can now say with relief that I have lived to see the back of. I learned about Emmett Till when I was maybe eight or nine, and it made me scared to turn 14. I don't remember exactly when I learned that Jesus was 33 when he was crucified, but whatever my Sunday school teacher said, it stuck, and you won't find another woman anywhere happier to have been turned 34 than I was, which happened three weeks ago on August 24th, 2021. 14 and 33, two birthdays I've been waiting for, two birthdays I've been dreading. If you'll humor me, I'd like to share with you a kind of poem. It's really a series of wild coincidences, a list of things I know to be true and strangely. It's the best way I know to try and hammer some sense out of the chaos of memory. On August 24th, 1955, Emmett Till was 14 and he whistled and it got him killed. Emmett Till traveled without his mother to visit her family. Mississippi was in that way, a second home for him, a geography of choice. My first trip alone was to visit my family of choice, my godmother in New York City. New York is where my family go, and I will always return. On August 24th, 2001, the first of my fearful birthdays arrived. I was 14. Three weeks later, I was 14 and in social studies in Tennessee when our entire class was called into the hallway to tell us that the world had ended in New York City. My father started his job in the Pentagon two days later. He was the lawyer in charge of the army appointed by the president. I'll never make peace with that. As part of the defense, Emmett Till's murderers, their lawyers, claim that black boys don't grow hair on their chests until they're much older than 14, they said. The river bloated body pulled from the Tallahatchie had shown telltale signs of his becoming, they said. So it couldn't have been a 14 year old boy, they said. 46 years later and I'm 14, and there was a second plane, they said. And then a third plane at the Pentagon, they said. I was a daddy girl then. And I didn't know he hadn't moved into his office yet. It was September 11th and I was scared and 14 with brown skin and already a woman's body and maybe a dead dad, 14 and scared of my own age because Emmett Till had taught me not to forget what grown men are capable of. 14 and my own becoming framed by war. I am on my father's side, the daughter of a black Republican he died black and breathless of asthma and bad choices at a hillbilly Civil War reenactment theater called Dixie Stampede. The war ain't over till it's over, I guess. They read a personal letter from George W. Bush at my father's funeral. The war ain't over till it's over, I guess. I was right to be afraid of 33, I guess. August 24th, 2020. It's 2020 and fearfully so, and I'm 33 and afraid of my age again and everyone dying and marching and trying to breathe. I mean, black bodies drowning in thin blue lines. I mean, 
When does a brown body, a brown boy become a threat? I mean, didn't I say this all started with Emmett Till? I mean, there are ages to be scared of. I mean, there are dates to remember. I mean, it's September 11th, 2021, and 20 years at war can make you confused about what it means to love America. 20 years of flags and guns and a red and white and black and bruised way of saying who we are. Well, I still love this place. 14 to 33 and I was raised in this fight and for it. The war ain't over till it's over. Memory is a weapon against oppression. The memory of today says love and tell the truth. The memory of today says, we know there's always been a war. It says, we were always made of this in the best and worst ways. America is still in her becoming. We will learn to choose each other. The war ain't over till it's over. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. That's really powerful and moving. So, as we all know, the entire machinery of the government transformed itself in response to the 9-11 attacks with wars for, and proliferating immigration restrictions and an elaborate apparatus dedicated to mass surveillance. Now, the global war on terrorism still goes on, I think as many of you know, in over 80 countries with drones and guerrillas and this global counterinsurgency. Now, there have been no major strikes on American soil in 20 years, and that is deemed a success, but it has come at a terrible cost to America's standing, with 60% of the country feeling America's on the wrong track. So I wanted to talk a little bit with our writers about how we got here. And Paul, I thought I'd start with you because, you know, we did start out together on that day, and you talked about the uh, surveillance of Muslims by the FBI. The Patriot Act came in so soon after the attacks on 9-11. Uh, on and the fears that Muslims had, which turned out to be justified, was that this could morph into indefinite detention or deportation or warrantless intrusions. And I remember you being worried for the drivers uh, in the neighborhood car service and what people must be going through in addition to what all of, all of us were, were suffering from. Well, I think what happened was um, a certain kind of panic spread very quickly. Um, and um, even though Bush made some efforts to say, no, Muslims are not our enemies, it's these uh, terrorists who are, um, it didn't really uh, take hold with the American public, nor with our law enforcement agencies at all. And um, everyone of Muslim background American Muslims uh, became suspect, and um, they were uh, interrogated, uh, some of them arrested, and uh, a feeling of fear spread among the community, which I don't think has actually ever gone away since then. Um, and, and this was, I think, the first step in this fraught moment of, uh, uh, as you, you talked about, immigration restrictions, and, and all the all the demonizing of others with the capital O. Uh, and in all cases, these are people who don't have what we would regard as white skin. And then we get into the whole question of, you know, the racist history of the United States and how it persists. And as Caroline says, and I agree with her 100%, the Civil War isn't over. It still hasn't been decided. I mean to say, um, sure, the, the military victory went to the North in 1865, but by 1896, the South had won the rhetorical war. And, uh, and that was when uh, uh, Plessy v. Ferguson was enacted by the Supreme Court and Jim Crow was established as the law of the land, segregation and segregation. And those years, those 90 years of Jim Crow and Remnants exist still throughout our society. Um, I think in many ways, and it's maybe heretical to say so, we're even worse than slavery because 
during the slave era, black bodies were considered property. Therefore, they had monetary value. And therefore, uh, um, people were reluctant just to kill black people because they were, in, in fact, burning money by doing that. Once slavery was abolished, then uh, black bodies were worth nothing. And therefore, they, they were subject to horrific attacks all through this era. And we're talking about the history of lynching in the United States. It's also the slaughters of entire black communities by enraged uh, uh, Ku Klux Klan and other racist uh, factions in the, in the society. Um, so it's it's stuff that we we continue to live with, and 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 the fact that it always galls me that the most popular movie in American history should have been that piece of trash, Gone with the Wind, which is a pro-slavery movie, and you know the noble cause has endured, and it has allowed us to um, uh, perpetuate these myths, and that's why you see all these Confederate flags all over the place. Um, because we have never punished the South for what it did, tearing the country apart. I mean, in this whole issue about statues, I'm glad so many of them are coming down now. But the argument on the part of the right wing now to say, you can't tear them down because they're part of our history. Well, imagine this, you go to Germany and everywhere you go, there are statues of Adolf Hitler and you see swastikas hanging, and you ask your German friend, what's going on? He said, well, it's part of our history. Uh, we would be appalled. And I'm just as appalled here, you know, when I see these signs of, you know, treasonous, racist hatred and horror that caused so many deaths, so much human misery, still being um, extolled by, by millions and millions of people in the country. You know, two things uh, became, in my mind, significant almost right away. Heather talked about trying to hold these opposite things in, in her mind, and that was the concept of American exceptionalism, which speaks to the ownership um, idea that you were just expressing, and then that twinned with words radical Islamic terrorism. And if you didn't use those words, you weren't an exceptional American. And we're still fighting over terminology. Uh, we're still using euphemisms like black sites and extraordinary rendition. Um, but it all became quite nebulous as time went on what was exceptional and what was terroristic. Absolutely. And I, I, I want to say, too, that one of the things that I find uh, we're, to talk about the present um, and how we're still burdened by the past, I'm shifting the conversation slightly, is that the, um, the very structures of the United States government, as they were established by the founders, um, have set up a situation in which um, for the most part of our history, we have been controlled by the minority. I mean, it's a country built for minority rule. Uh, when you think about something like uh, the institution of the Senate, two senators from every state, it's ridiculous. You have 40 million people in California, 580,000 in Wyoming, they each have two senators. Um, um, and uh, things like the Electoral College, which is so antiquated and so awful, and we've gotten our two worst presidents of the 21st century because of this, um, and um, I mean, people who lost the popular vote, George W. Bush and Donald Trump, um, and, and yet Bush, through that legal coup of the Supreme Court, was given the Electoral College vote, and, and Trump squeaked by and, and won it in 2016, and the depredations created by those two uh, have... Um, put us in a bad spot, um, a really dangerous spot. I don't think we've been here since the beginning of the Civil War. And uh, I tremble when I think about the future of the country. I'm hopeful. I mean, I agree with Heather that I do have some hope. And the very fact that we're having this meeting today and talking about these things 
I take as a sign of hope. And um, and that's my theory. Just that my wife and I uh, joined the beginning of what we then called Writers Against Trump uh, more than a year ago. And now we have morphed into Writers for Democratic Action since the election. And we're going to keep doing our little bit to say, speak the truth as, as, as clearly as we can. And, and just hope that um, some people are listening to us. Well, look what can happen. Look at Barbara Lee deciding to be the sole dissenting vote, you know, back in back in 2001. And uh, Heather, I would like to talk to you about otherism, which we've just been talking about, and birtherism, and this whole notion, and you alluded to it in, in your remarks, that this too became a way of uh, with with violence or without, Caroline, to obviously talk about the most violent incidents in racial history, but to negate someone is to make them an other. Birtherism is essentially otherism. And this became, how did, how is that linked to our wars and to the war on terror? How do those two things go together? Well, let's let's keep it to, to the war on terror, if you will, simply because it's I'm a historian and I don't want to lump, lump all the, the wars together. But the power of othering people is to create a community amongst yourselves, amongst the, the core group, the, excuse me, but the homeland, if you will. And that was something that was deployed very effectively, I think, after 9-11 to go ahead and push through uh, an economic and political um, and social program that was in fact embraced by a minority. And that has taken us on the path down which we have currently gone. But what I was really hoping to focus on for what I was talking about was not so much, even the concept of American exceptionalism, which of course the Bush administration does use to great effect in the uh, immediate aftermath of 9-11. Um, but rather, you know, it, it's really striking to me when you look at how people remember 9-11, they don't remember that side of America. They remember people helping each other and they remember what America can be. And, and they remember Flight 93 and they remember people helping each other out of the towers and they remember what New York was like. And to me, the way that Americans embrace this horrific anniversary by emphasizing those parts of who we are, which are in fact as deeply embedded in our history as the other th side that I talked about. I think that says a lot about where we are politically now, but also what we could become. And, you know, I was thinking about this and I was thinking about the fact that if you look at the early Virginia laws in the 1600s, um, almost immediately what you see, I mean, because he isn't the central question, how does a country that, that thinks of itself this way become the other country? And of course, that's what I study is how politics end up shaping a society and not necessarily reflecting it. But if you look at the Virginia laws as early as the 1600s, uh, late 1600s, there are laws in which lawmakers who are trying to establish control over a society that is increasingly coming out of their control because of the the, the spread of more and more people who are living out their indentures or buying their way out of enslavement, they start to pass laws telling white and black people not to work together. That if you work together, you know, you're both going to get punished more. Don't run away together. Don't fight back against us. Don't work together. We need to be in control. And that attempt from the beginning to go ahead and, and put lawmakers from a small group in charge of everybody else, um, you know, it, it keeps coming back again and again and again. It feels like we're very much here right now again. And yet when I look at this 20th anniversary, which feels to me as if it's being celebrated or commemorated in a very different way than the previous years have been, I wonder if what we're seeing now in this moment is a redefinition of America to take us back to where we believed we were 20 years ago. Well, don't you think that so many of us feel that American democracy itself is at risk after 20 years of this? I mean, I think when I see those blue lights bathing lower Manhattan and bathing the sky, I think about January 6th, as several of you have mentioned. I think about um, the Voting Rights Act, the way that we are fighting for what seemed to me to be the kinds of fundamental truths that um, you would think had always motivated people. But, you know, you just talked about how that can get absconded with by a very small group. So how did we get from the kinds of celebrations? And I don't want to short shrift anybody who was was heroic and giving and generous. 
But we're also, this September 11th, living in the third column of the, an insurrection, you know, at the Capitol. And that's, that's in the sky, too. And um, we can't ignore it. Well, isn't that the question? How you get from a society that envisions itself one way. And one of the things that I think is important to remember is that 9-11 did not start the change that so many of us are identifying, that that change was underway at by at least 1937 as a pushback against FDR and really took momentum on after Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. And then of course, with the rise of Goldwater and finally with uh, the election of Ronald Reagan, you know, there is this, this momentum going on and and, and there we'll take it back to your argument about or your question about othering that the othering of Americans, the division of Americans, as in you can't work together, you know, the, the, the politicians saying these are the bad guys don't work together is enormously effective. But I'm hoping that we have reached a point when we look at at where we have come since this extraordinary moment 20 years ago, that Americans get that now, at least enough Americans get that, that we will push back against it. Because I think you're right, that if we don't, we will have lost the democracy that gave us flight 93, if you will, and instead give us the democracy or but the autocracy that the administration um, really ran with after 9-11. Yeah. Let's get uh, Caroline in here. Caroline, would you do you want to speak to something here about the where the American democratic experiment is at this moment, whether it's unraveling with urgency or hanging by a thread or um... well I don't I don't want to be a pessimist. Um, <laughs> I you know I can only speak to what I've witnessed and what I understand from being a good student. My, you know, my academic field is in, you know, writing and in Shakespeare and things like that. But um, it seems to me that I think America began othered, do you know? And I think that that's one of the strangest, as I've said this before, but, you know, I think we have to remember that the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution were written by a man who owned his own children. Um, so the idea of the democratic experiment, we're really asking America to become something it's never been or even attempted to be, which is inclusive of all of the people that live on, on its land um, and integrating all of their concerns into the collective concerns of the country, because we've never actually done that. Um, and the country wasn't actually designed to do that. Um, and so we have to be creative about asking uh, the, found, the documents and the representation in the places of power to do work that's never actually been done. Um, and I think that we can't be naive about like bias and people's limitations. Uh, you know, when we think about Flight 93, I'm part of the complex complexity of 20 years ago. I mean, I remember when I was 14, I didn't even have language to talk about my otheredness when I was feeling othered. I didn't know that I wasn't just supposed to swallow the racism I was experiencing. We were just a melting pot at that point, right? America was just trying to allow everything to work. We were sort of in some strange, like neo reconstruction, like right after, you know, after the Civil War, we sent black people to the House, <laughs> and to the Senate <laughs> for a minute. You know, but and I feel like there was something of uh, a, a gasp like that after the sort of the the, the MLK era civil rights movement uh, mo motion of the civil rights movement. And I think that I grew up in the early part during that. And I feel like what we're really just witnessing is the return of a new Jim Crow situation um, because we've never actually beat this illness back. Um, and we sort of have this antibiotic resistant strain now of the disease um, that's quite frightening. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it reminded me of what Heather was saying. You ha it's sort of like, where do you cast your glance? And I guess that's why we're having this conversation, you know, because where we're still in progress here. And who's, yeah. who's, going, to, who's going to get to write the song that we want to sing about ourselves? When I think we are writing the song, we have to. We want to sing about ourselves. We have to write. It. We have to. <laughs> so we invited writers for Democratic. Women. We're including all of you in that. And we're going to come to your questions in just a minute. I'm mindful of the time, and believe me, we'll get a lot in. But I think I did just want to point out that when we talk about terrorism 
And the early days after 9-11, I thought so much about how the greatest act of terrorism prior to that on American soil had been by a white supremacist in Oklahoma. I happened to be on the air uh, the day that McVeigh was executed, Timothy McVeigh. And there are tinges now when I think about this rally coming up next uh, weekend in Washington uh, to celebrate the, those people who attacked the Capitol. Uh, we're ready. We're definitely back in this mix. I think that I think we've all been addressing here are better angels and and not. Um, I think unless one of the, somebody else wants to make a point um, that we should save some time for questions because we have quite a few of them. Do you feel ready to go to that, writers? Okay. Fire away, everyone. All right. All right. Um, here's an interesting question. Um, is it time to repeal the Patriot Act? The Patriot Act? Yeah, which was, I believe, enacted on October the 26th of uh, 2001. So not long after the attacks on the towers. And of well, course, the Patriot Act is to refresh people. Gives the United States these enormous surveillance powers that it well, now has. Yeah. Uh, my automatic quick response is yes. Yeah. Quite simply, yes. But it would be very hard to do, of course. It would be very, very hard to do. Everything's um, hard. It's going to be hard even to get rid of the filibuster. Right. Um, it's going to be hard to get rid of gerrymandering. It's going to be hard to, you know, fix all the things that are systemically wrong with the way we govern ourselves. Um, it's not that it's impossible. But um, it's difficult for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, let's let's take another here. Um, let's see. Perhaps Americans have demonstrated over the past several months for the wrong reasons that politicians are fine with demonstrations uh, for any reason as long as it's not against them. I don't know. Fine with demonstrations for any reasons. Um, so I'm missing that as a question. I think that politicians have had a remarkable ability to, well, one, one of the things we're seeing now is the denial of truth and the denial of fact and the denial of, of what the legitimacy of what you see with your own eyes. Is that something new, Heather, the notion that yes, create a reality? We have always had um, conspiracy theories and we have always had um, political spin. But the systemic embracing of gaslighting by a political party is absolutely new in, in our history, uh, certainly by major party. I mean, you could argue the populist did to some degree in the 1890s, but, but no, this is absolutely new. And I think it's important to remember that the current day Republican Party is not the traditional Republican Party either. I mean, we're in a, we're in a very new moment altogether. Um, Do you want to say a little bit about how the war on terror gave us Trumpism? Can we link it like that, or is that too tidy? I think it's a little bit too tidy. As I say, I think that that if you look at the entire history of the George W. Bush administration, his election, and then the real move toward movement conservatism during his administration, um, it's kind of uh, movement conservatism on steroids, this idea that a, a few individuals should run society and we should cut taxes so that money moves up and we should have an imperial presidency. But all those roots were much deeper than that. And Certainly, it got really jump-started with George W. Bush in a really important way economically with the sense that by going ahead and pushing so much money toward a certain kind of military, at the same time what that administration does was it slashed domestic spending. And at the same time that theoretically it was keeping us safer, what it did is it took that money and it put it into programs that were new programs and they were staffed with uh, true believers, if you will, rather than with career officials. So it did in fact put into our veins a, a real uh, extra shot of the economic, social, and political policy that had been dominating, to dominating the Republican Party, come to dominate the Republican Party 
uh, really during the George H.W. Bush administration. But then by the time you get to Trump, I think what you've got is a man who's not a politician so much as a salesman, and he knows all these threads, he gets all these threads, and he inherits two generations of Americans who are really primed to hear his message with its full on racism and sexism and xenophobia and the idea of slashing taxes so black and brown people and women don't get any benefits from the government. And he does this in such a way that he provide. I actually was absolutely fascinated by Trump because he really was a snapshot of America. Mm -hmm. But that snapshot of America, in a way, obviously, has taken us to the precipice of January 6th and, and quite frankly, where we are now, which I think is even more dangerous than January 6th. But at the same time, a, a lot more people now are able to see it. Um, so there is a straight line, but it's not it didn't start with 9-11. It didn't start with George W. Bush. It started I, I, in 1937 when a group of lawmakers who wanted to get rid of the New Deal came together between the 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 unreconstructed Southern Democrats and the Western Republicans. Well, you know, just a quick aside, having been in Iraq in 2003, I, I was there often between 2003 and 2007, meeting some of the American uh, administrators in the green zone, sitting in on some of these crazy discussions that, uh, you know, I remember they were giving uh, Iraqi women licenses to carry a pistol, the murder of civilians, civilian after civilian, which took place in Iraq um, by gangs or criminals, uh, people opposed to them, because we couldn't control that, right? The collateral damage of chaos. So, and, and then the uh, elevation of incompetent people that who might have connections. Uh, and that seemed to me, in my experience, rather startling. I don't know if it was new, but it was startling to see some of these political appointees who had absolutely zero experience that's something that comes back in the, in the Trump era. Well, and certainly in the Bush administration, the DeLilio um, man who ran the, um, one of the, the uh, faith-based offices in the White House said, you know, these are, you know, Mayberry Machiavelli's. They, they don't have any idea what they're doing. That idea, that denigration of expertise and the idea that basically anybody can do it so long as you have the right genes or so long as you're in the right circles, that you can go ahead and, and figure things out. And I think it's really, you know, kind of an aside here, but I think it kind of surprises sometimes people who have gotten themselves into position of power, positions of power to discover there's actually work to be done. It's not just a question of telling the right story the way that uh, the member of the Bush administration told yeah. Ron Suskind in 2004, you know, we make our own reality. Well, you can make your own reality on places like the Fox News Channel, but you can't make your own reality in the halls of Congress except through violence. And it's, it's really sort of interesting to watch a new generation who has come to believe that education doesn't matter and expertise doesn't matter and you can just make the world change by talking about it in a different way. Uh, it's been interesting to watch that come to the fore. Well, uh, God bless every civics teacher in high schools. I've got a pal like that back in Wisconsin. Uh, I'm going to take another question here. Um, question for Paul Oster. Your novel, Man in the Dark, which I'm teaching to my high school students, deals with an America that reacts very differently to the bush Gore election, leading to the Civil War and an absence of the 9-11 attacks, and now the events of that non-America feels much more likely. So how's our response to 9-11 led us to a place where events like January 6th threatened the American foundation like never before? Well, he's really read your book, Paul. He says, should we, like Owen Brick, be preparing for this? Gosh, well, how, how I, well I'm, I wonder if, I, I, well, good for those high school students. I hope their brains aren't damaged by, by reading the book. But um, uh, it's 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 an older man who's 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 injured and he's lying in bed. He's he's staying at his daughter's house with his granddaughter and he can't sleep, and he lies awake at night, um, making up stories to pass the time, and he he comes up with this story about how, and I think it's it of course reflects the anger I felt in two thousand after the election. Uh, why wasn't there more protest after this? Um, a Supreme Court decision that just handed the election to Bush. Uh, why wasn't there more? Well, my character invents another America, an alternative America in which there is a civil war that starts over this. And, um, and, and therefore, the history that followed after that is altogether different. And 9-11 uh, 
which I think, I mean, just not to parenthetically, it seems that, you know, the intelligence agencies knew this was happening and about to happen. Uh, you now there were reports, you know, Obama prepared to, uh, Os Osama bin Laden prepared to attack US. Um, and that from what I've learned, um, the Bush administration came in and they discarded all the intelligence compiled by the Clinton administration and were caught flat footed. Uh, if Gore had been in office, I think he would have acted on this and maybe, maybe, maybe 9-11 wouldn't have happened. At least there's that possibility. Um, and it's it's often just fascinating, and I'm sure Heather thinks about this all the time as a history professor, that, that, that we're always at a fork in the road and all kinds of things can happen if you turn left or turn right. Um, I, I just don't believe in the inevitability of, of things. Um, it's always within the power of human beings to act and to and to push in one direction or another um uh you know you get terrible leaders and they uh they spew out a rhetoric that brings out the worst in people because we're all multiple beings and we we're all very uh capable of being influenced by what's going on around us or you get a good leader who's who's offering rhetoric that is bringing people together and is calling upon the better sides of people's impulses. Um, and it's all, I mean, just history is replete with, with these, the differences that can take place. So I don't really know. I mean, I, I can't really answer this man's question because I simply don't know. And I, I can't prescribe anything. I can tell you what I would wish would happen. And I, I could also say I wish I could tell you what I wish had happened in, in my own lifetime, the thousands of moments when I've seen the wrong decisions being made when they didn't have to be. Um, so I'm, I'm um, unable to give a satisfactory response. I'm sorry. Uh, there's another question here um, from the writer Elizabeth Rossner, uh, who is in the Bay Area, and she's written a lot about trauma and epigenetics. Can you comment on ways that we seem to be increasingly willing to identify collective trauma in the moment, yet so generally unwilling to address the underlying causes from the past? I'm thinking especially of the nuanced discussion of epigenetics and working back to the generations, which is something you were speaking about, Caroline, and I think really informs your writing. Sorry, I'm just looking at the text of the question to the ways we seem to be increasingly willing to identify collective trauma in the moment, yet so I'm generally unwilling to address the underlying causes from the past. I mean, I think this sort of speaks to, I think that we can, we're, we're getting more and more this language of saying, okay, I see you, I hear you. I'm creating space for you to process your truth, which and I don't use process in air quotes because I think it's wrong, but because I think that we use it, um, and then we don't know what we're actually inviting people to do always when we offer that space. And I think that part of it, it comes to a question um, that I've been thinking about as you guys have been talking about how in some complicated ways, what stymies conversation attached to the American exceptionalist notion is this notion that um, you can't be on the left and be an unabashed patriot that you can't be willing if I to you know want to be willing to send a son or daughter overseas to fight on behalf of this country to wear the cloth of the nation and be an unabashed lover of America. We're divided in this country about how we allow ourselves to talk about what this place is, to name what is going on here, and then to move forward. Because for me, I know that I have no mysteries about loving this country despite a desperate desire to see it change. Um, I don't I am not ashamed to be an American abroad or on the American soil. What I am is uh, exhausted by its failures, just like any family member would be, the family member who continues to fail, um, but who I will always open my door to. I'm exhausted by the failures of this country and I want to point them out so that they can do better. And I think that there's, you know, when we talk about collective trauma and naming it in the present, we all saw January 9th, but some people, get resistant when we say, well, when we talk about September 11th, we've also got to talk about how this country has sort of 
always failed to heal. And so even when we talk about how we came together 20 years ago, there are some of us that were like, we weren't even together 20 years ago. Like, I don't even know what you're talking about, right? So we can't, we can't actually even remember things accurately until we actually know what was going on together. So I think, and I think that naming the past creates fractures. And when we're wanting to heal and come together, that's hard. Um, this is why people go to therapy. They don't couples therapy. You can't just like say all of the shit you did to each other to each other without somebody else there. <laughs> Excuse my language. But we have, but like, but we need, but the problem is like we want to do better together. But if we say, okay, well, tell me how you feel, then everyone gets defensive and fractures further. Right. And so I think that that's part of why this is, it's written on us differently. One, our bodies remember different things because they've lived through different things too. And then three, this desire to be good to each other in the present is complicated by a need for repair from the ills of the past in the first place and people's defensiveness about addressing that, I think. Well, I definitely resonate to, you know, can you be a good liberal and a good and a good American and love the country? And I certainly am saying yes, but you know, I I when I'm in Wisconsin where I vote, because New York doesn't need me and Maryland doesn't need me in terms of my vote. Um, I have neighbors who so are so different from my neighbors elsewhere, and I have to look at the uh, Tea Party flag mm -hmm. and, uh, just about every single day. And since January 6th, that flag has become uh, ever more uh, objectionable to me. And I thought that our my home village should take it down, flies it downtown in uh, sort of a, the public square on this veteran's walk. And I learned that there were actually 13 uh, different flags in, in the Revolutionary War era. And the yellow one is only one of those things. So symbols and, and trauma, they do morph, you know, and things that uh, don't necessarily creep right away. But over time, that memory becomes, or that reaction, I should say, um, becomes more, more energetic. And um, anyway, we didn't win in getting the flag taken down. <laughs> um, can, I just, can I just throw in something here about epigenetics? And I think one of the, there are two reasons, three reasons maybe that people don't like to take on historical trauma and epigenetics being one of the big ones for historians is that we know how well arguments in the past have, have grabbed the popular conversation by saying, oh, well, that group of people is not like the rest of us because they have grown to... Uh, embrace their uh, their subordinate position. And so I think historians hear about epigenetics and they see it through that social lens and they worry about it a lot and mm -hmm. say, you know, we get it, we read the stuff, but we're not putting it out there because we know who's reading us and how they're going to use that. So that's one thing. I also think people don't know their history very well. They just don't know it. So they, they don't, they can't, you know, when people are shocked by things like the Tulsa massacre, um, you know, we do the best we can on our side of the table, but a lot of people just don't know things. And I do think we're coming to a reckoning with how we teach history in America, uh, not only because of the fight against the um, critical race theory, but simply because uh, of, of how little time we have to teach everyone what they need to know. Um, but then I also think that, that one of the reasons we have trouble grappling with the past is because of the fact that we live in a place where we need to garner votes for the next election. And it makes it, it, it is often a problem that our coming to a real grip with our uh, what our society should look like runs into the trouble of the fact we need to get 50.1 percent of the votes in the next election or we're going to lose it all. Mm -hmm. And that's um, that's something that is, uh, I think, really counter to what we need to do as a, as a country and why writers are so important and poets and uh, and and musicians and all the people who can can keep those questions alive and those searches going while other people are saying, okay, yeah, we need to grapple with that, but we need to put together constituents to win 50.1% of the vote, or we're gonna lose it all. And the part yeah. of, or we're gonna lose it all is actually one of the, the reasons I'm here with Writers for Democratic Action is that um, there are many things we need to grapple with, but in my worldview, if we lose control of our democratic process to people who are trying to destroy it, none of the rest is going to matter. And, no. and that's what that's uh, I, I think the three reasons really that people don't grapple with the past as as 
perhaps, not as perhaps, as much as they should. I mean, I lived in the past like 20 hours a day, so I get how important it is, but I do think there are boundaries around that in our current society that, um, that make it difficult sometimes for people to grapple with that. Well, the speed of the culture definitely uh, doesn't, doesn't allow people, I think that's why your letter has become so popular because it's a way uh, to link up with history. And I know as a journalist, when you're pushing for that five o'clock deadline, when you're on the air with 23 million people, seconds after something happened and you can't explain it, uh, you feel pretty weak, you know? And so we need, we need this kind of long view. We're, we're beginning to run out of time and I'm just wondering, um, over my shoulder is a painting that I got in Kabul uh, right after the Taliban fell. It was, I think, one of the first, I'm gonna get it back to the proper Afghan NGO, but right after one of the first paintings made of the human face after uh, the Taliban had been at that time pushed out. Does anyone want to say anything about where we find ourselves 20 years after 9-11, the aftermath that we're talking about uh, exiting that country and trying to end forever wars? Well, I, I, I want to end on a different note um, because, you know, we're, we're facing another uh, giant crisis in America now simultaneously, which is the pandemic. Uh, that hasn't been mentioned today. I don't know if Heather would agree with me or not, but I've long had this feeling that America, since the very beginning, even starting in colonial days, um, but especially after the founding of the Republic, we have really been divided between uh, two different views of democracy. Um, the people who believe that democracy is a system of government that empowers people to do pretty much whatever they want. Freedom, this is the word Bush always used. He never said, we're defending our democracy. He'd say, we're defending our freedom. There are those, and then the, the, the others, and I would include myself in the second group, those of us who believe we live in a society and we're, uh, we're connected to others and we're therefore responsible to others. As, and the democratic system gives us the obligation. It's not just about rights, which is what the first group is talking about all the time, but the obligations of democracy, which is to take care and help those who are poor, sick, or you know, unable to, to function. It's our responsibility as human beings living in a society that we ourselves are responsible for. We don't have a king or an emperor telling us what to do. We have to make these decisions together. So here we are in this crisis that is growing by the day in which, I don't know what the numbers are, 25 or 30% or 35% of the public does not want to be vaccinated for all kinds of reasons. And the, and, the, and the general argument on the part of these people is it's, it's a matter of free choice. And therefore, I can do what I want to do. But it's not a matter of free choice because you live in a society. And it's, it's as if to say, I have the free choice, you know, to dump toxic waste into the river in your backyard because I can do whatever I want to do. Try to stop me. Um, I, can, I can refuse to be vaccinated. Therefore, turning myself into a potential murderer or perhaps committing suicide or both um, without feeling any, any responsibility. Um, so I think we're, we're stuck with this. And I, I, I don't know how you can't argue people out the, 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 the every man for himself vision of democracy in America. I, it's very difficult to have a rational conversation with these people. They're so yeah. firm in their belief that they're right. And I'm so firm in my belief that I'm right, that we live together and not as monads, you know, that don't connect. Yeah. Um, I don't know where this, this is going to come out in the end. We'll, we'll see. We'll see. But um, it's a great mystery to me how so many people can be so selfish. Well, we seem to definitely be you know, we talk about the speed of the culture, rushing towards something, and I'm not sure what it is, but the Voting Rights Act um, that's coming down the pike, that's going to tell us tell us a great deal. And I think it's what is the legacy now, 20 years on, and why forums like this one are so vitally important. Yeah. 
And I want to just mention before we part, uh, I thank all of you for participating. I, I can tell you that it's, it's just wonderful to have, um, you know, this kind of, of, of smart and reflective and interesting conversation go on that's not just in very small pieces. Because, you know, even as a journalist, it's like I have, you have to wind it up. This, this kind of forum is, is just fantastic. So thank you to uh, Writers for Democratic Action. Uh, people have been asking, where do they find the website? It's writersfordemocraticaction.org. And um, also the next events are going to be November the 16th in Florida. Uh, sorry, in North Carolina, November 16th. I'm sorry. October the 16th in North Carolina and in Florida on December the 2nd. And then next year, I'll be hosting something in Wisconsin. So I hope everybody got a chance to, to ask questions and say what they want to say. Yes, this has been recorded. So if you missed a part of it or somehow didn't hear it, um, you will be able to do so again and again. So I just want to say, as I said at the beginning, it's a real privilege being here with you. Heather and Paul and Caroline, just fantastic. And Todd Gitlin, thank you so much. And Siri Husted, thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. All on down the pike. And Heather and Caroline, thank you also. Thank you both. This was wonderful. Good luck, everyone. Good luck. Thanks.